Our first session today features Joanne Boucher from the Political Science Department at the University of Winnipeg. Joanne received her BA in Film Studies from Carleton University, as did I, we were classmates, uh, in Ottawa in 1980 before turning to political science. Her PhD is from York University. Joanne's interests include early modern and feminist political thought. She's written for the SAS newsletter, most recently contributing a review of Harry Reichman's book, The Future of Academic Freedom. Joanne will speak to us today on Thomas Hobbes against identity politics. Joanne. Hello, can you hear me? Oop. I can hear you, Joanne. Should I, but there's no picture of me? No, just your name. Is that okay? Uh, we'd rather have a picture, but this is okay. How do I make a picture? Do I press start video? That's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm not very good at this. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, the title of my talk is Hobbes Against Identity Politics. This may seem a bit odd, but I'll try to convince you, and it's my contention, that Hobbes' uh, view of politics and view of the human personality actually offers a very strong counter to identity politics. So we'll see if I can convince you of this. Um, and the reason I'm talking about identity politics, which may seem self-evident to a lot of you, is that identity politics is at the heart of a lot of the debates about academic freedom and freedom of speech, particularly in North America and Europe. And there are a number of commentators who've tried to tackle what they see as some of the problems of identity politics. I, here I can just mention a few, Asad Haider, Kwame Anthony Apaya, and someone like Douglas Murray. But I actually think, and this is what I'll argue, is that if you look at the philosophy, political philosophy of Thomas Hobbes, his dates are 1588 to 1670, 1679, so this thinker from the 17th century actually, I think, offers a quite a deep uh, critique or allows us to develop a deep critique of identity politics. Um, so for those of you familiar with the politics of Thomas Hobbes, this may seem like an extremely strange claim, given that Hobbes is often seen as a philosopher of some very negative politics, power politics. Uh, it's often claimed that he sees human beings as atomized, self-seeking, power-mongering power -mongering automatons. And in fact, his ideal political system is absolute sovereignty. So this may not seem like a great basis to offer a sort of healthy um, counterpoint to identity politics. In any case, we'll see how it goes and see if you find this convincing. So for instance, in terms of his claims of the uh, wonders of an absolute sovereign, he calls the absolute sovereign the father of all the children of pride. One of his most famous or infamous statements is that in a state of nature, a condition where there's no government, that there would be a war of all against all. So this doesn't, you know, so these are some of the sort of cliches about Hobbes, I think, um, that often lend a negative view to his politics, but we'll see. So first what I'll do is I'm going to define what I think are identity politics, identify what I see as some of the problems with it, and then talk about Hobbes's political philosophy as a counterpoint um, to a lot of the claims of identity politics. My comments are pretty general about identity politics, so there may be problems that people have with that. Similarly, I'm treating Hobbes quite generally. But in any case, so in terms of uh, talking about identity politics and defining it, um, I would argue that identity politics rests on the notion that society is a complex of power, a complex structure of power relations. So the capitalist economy, for instance, the state, all institutions embody these power relationships that constitute society. So all human beings, the idea goes, enter, uh, enter into society, and so they enter into power relations. However, they don't do so as equals. There is a range of ways in which as they enter society, particular persons 
are marked as inferior, situated as inferior, because they belong to specific groups, specific identities. And this dictates the, um, their position as winners or losers in society. So the identities which these politics focus on are those that are deemed to be marginal, oppressed, unheard. They are not dominant, they are not powerful. So the political strategy, it seems, of identity politics is to mobilize all of these disadvantaged groups to plead their case, to reposition them in, in a system so that they are able to overthrow the system in their own interests. And the goal seems to be to create a truly free and equal um, society. So some of the groups that are defined as oppressed and slotted into power relations in society would be to begin with women. The argument would be that women have historically been oppressed and continue to be oppressed in relation to men. Therefore, women are oppressed and males have male privilege. All males have male privilege. Uh, other groups would be racial groups or ethnic groups that are oppressed by systemic racism. This is seen to be a feature, uh, a continuous feature of Western civilization. These people enter society as others, weak, unheard, in relation to white people. Consequently, white people have white privilege. There can also be religious others, individuals who are from, in terms of Western society, non-Christian backgrounds, so they're oppressed by the dominant religion. There are also sexual others. This includes people who are non-traditional in their sexual preferences and practices. They are not heteronormative. Therefore, they are others and othered by society. They are oppressed by the dominant paradigm of heterosexuality. Then there are class others. Working class people are less powerful than the bourgeoisie, the rich. Therefore, they are others. And that's one group. Disability, for instance, would be another um, group slotted into power relations. Individuals who are differently abled physically or emotionally, they're not seen as normal and so forth. <clears throat> so therefore, they're in an inferior position in society. Identity politics then, I think, offers a sort of grid of characteristics that are assumed to position all members of that identity group into a fixed social position that assures that they are losers in the system. So those are, that's sort of a sketch of what I think identity politics are. Uh, in terms of some of the problems with identity politics, just to highlight some and then I'll, I'll, turn, to, I'll turn to Hobbes. Um, the list, some of the problems first, the list is selective. That is to say, and it's not always, there is some historical, there's lots of historical basis why some groups are selected, but certain social harms are selected and others are ignored. For instance, there's overwhelming evidence that features of human, uh, human beings, such as height or physical beauty, overwhelmingly advantage individuals in terms of the job market, success, success in social life, and so on and so forth. But these are rarely complained about, and it's an interesting question as to why that might be, why there is no movement of the short to uh, change the rules for the National Basketball Association so that the short cannot be discriminated against in order to allow them in. Uh, similarly, physical beauty, overwhelming evidence that this is an advantage in all aspects of social and economic life. And this is rarely complained about, but I have to say this isn't for lack of trying. There's one academic, Deborah Rode, who wrote a book called The Beauty Bias, and she tried to make an argument that this beauty bias should be addressed by uh, workplaces, but uh, it hasn't caught on, although uh, there may be human resources um, departments in, for example, universities that might be, and government agencies that might be on alert for this. So stay tuned with that one. So another problem too, so the list is selective, but also I think uh, a kind of central problem, which a lot of critics note, is that these fixed characteristics don't necessarily have fixed meanings or fixed inevitability in terms of outcomes of people's lives, in terms of their uh, uh, experience in the social system. 
so a fixed meaning, for instance, you start with a category of woman, women are oppressed, there's male privilege. The problem is, and identity politics recognizes this, but I think has great difficulty with it. There's like a sort of shuffling of people on the grid where you sort of go up and down. But so you can have a woman who is a victim of women's oppression and so on and so forth. However, as we know, there are many women who are wealthy, well-educated, well-connected, have great family backgrounds, have great resources, consequently are high on the power hier hierarchy. So it's difficult to know what to make of that. Similarly, with an issue such as race, you look at the United States of America, it's often said there you have, you know, a black president, uh, Barack Obama, and so on and so forth, who is more powerful than 99.9% of Americans. So what do you do with that? Um, it's also the case in terms of a, a sort of offshoot of this, in terms of people going up and down the grid, we now see how uh, human beings uh, who are deemed oppressed can be put on the grid, taken off the grid. And we see this phenomenon with uh, the question of homosexuality in relation to trans issues. So for instance, gay men and lesbians who have in social movements been seen as marginalized and oppressed are now increasingly, some overtly, uh, placed on the identity, identity grid as oppressors and winners in relation to trans people and non-binary individuals and so forth. The problem with gay men and lesbians is that they live by, their sexuality is defined by biological binary categories of male and female. This is now considered um, <clears throat> a forbidden claim. So they get taken off the grid of the oppressed. So, those are some of the problems, but also I think that it leads to inevitably a sort of toxic form of politics, which is obsessed with categorizing people um, and so on and so forth. It assumes, I think it also assumes that human cooperation and human understanding is not possible. That is to say, there's something that it's curious. On the one hand, you have this sort of uh, paradigm formed with group identities. At the same time, it's fantastically subjective insofar as lots of the grievances are often about feelings and uh, a, a, a claim that if you're not a woman no one can no man can ever understand you and so on and so forth so it's a sort of funny mix of that uh, so i'll leave that aside for the minute and then turn to hobbes so hobbes um uh as i said i think uh offers a paradigm that can take us out of this um, reduction of human beings and rigidity about politics. So first thing to say about Hobbes, if you know, people are familiar or not with him, is that I think that Hobbes was, and I don't think it's acknowledged that much, was a profoundly radical thinker. And I think that the key to his radicalism was uh, the fact that he was a thoroughgoing, uncompromising materialist. For him, all of the world was body. All of the world was material. So here's a quote, for instance, from his masterpiece, Leviathan. He says, the world is corporeal, that is to say body, and has the dimensions of magnitude, length, breadth, and depth. Also, every part of body is likely body, and has the like dimension, and consequently, every part of the universe is body and that which is not body is no part of the universe so this obviously got hobbes into trouble in the 17th century which is why leviathan was burned by the common hangman and uh hobbes was blamed for the fire of london in 1666 for his atheism in any case setting that aside so uh so as part of the universe then, this material universe. Human beings are by definition material beings. We are matter in motion. We are embodied creatures. And this is our inescapable and shared human condition. Human bodies, he argues, driven by desire, are the basis of what we are and what we are able to be in this world. The body, I think for him, is the great leveling fact that all human beings confront. And human beings are, because they're, they're physical, 
um, embodied creatures are simultaneously frail and potentially powerful. We're all mortal, we're all vulnerable, but we can also exercise power in the world to get what we want. And the ultimate aim he thinks that we should strive towards and that people want to strive towards is what he calls a commodious life. So in terms of the politics that derive from this, uh, as Hobbes argues is, part of the problem for human beings is precisely that we are all the same. We are all bodies and we wish to live well and preserve our bodies, but we are also unique and encased in our own bodies. And also he argues that we can never really know others. We can never know other people's true thoughts and desires. And that really is the basis of human conflict. Um, so I'll set that aside. So he talks about us being material beings, but we're also a particular type of material being. We are thinking bodies and our fate is to use our reason to attain the things that we desire. So for him, reason and desire uh, occur simultaneously in human beings. So our fundamental uh, shared desire is to preserve our bodies and uh, crucially for him to avoid pain and violence. Uh, so this then is the foundational uh, problem or condition in which we attempt to uh, construct politics and uh, try to construct societies where we can live peacefully and cooperatively. And this is problematic, again, given the character of human beings and given uh, the human condition. That is to say, we're all maneuvering in the social world and we never know the true aims of others. They may wish to harm us. Uh, we may have something that they desire. So his argument is, is that we are social, I think we're social beings, but we're not innately sociable. And that's the problem of politics. So Hobbes then uh, offers a vision of politics and the principles on which we can achieve a uh, peaceful society. So he gives us, in my view, a more, much more complex and rich uh, picture of human motivations and the human character than anything we can get from identity politics. So one of the best uh, locations for information about this is chapters 10 and 11 of Leviathan. Chapter 10 is of power, worth, dignity, honor, and worthiness, and chapter 11 is of the difference of manners. Here Hobbes describes the characteristics which constitute the human personality. And at the core of what he argues is, is that we all have powers at our disposal that we can mobilize to negotiate through life. He thinks that and argues that all human beings have certain powers available to them. And I'll talk about that. So he describes uh, our general motivation as, uh, and this is from Leviathan, I put forward a general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that seizes only in death. So that we have this uh, use of our powers to achieve our desires. The problem, political problem, one of the political problems for him is that there is no ultimate aim or ultimate good, but each individual determines desi uh, their desires and devises their own template of what is good. And without a state, his argument is, this leads to war, the war of all against all. Um, so, but there are a few qualities, he argues, that drive people to uh, cooperation and to form political societies where, where they can achieve peace. Uh, and those desires are the desire of ease and sensual delight. These desires drive us to use our reason to uh, sort out how we can live together peacefully. So uh, this is how Hobbes defines power, because this is often seen as, uh, I think it's often understood as sort of power politics, domination and so forth. And I actually don't think that's what is entirely meant at all. So he defines the power of a man is his present means to obtain some future apparent good. In other words, a human power is simply a human capacity that allows people to engage with the world and with one another to achieve particular ends. So for him, there are two types of power, natural, that would be sort of your innate, uh, 
immutable human characteristics. If you're tall, if you're short, um, if you have an incredibly high IQ, those sorts of things. And then instrumental powers, which would be more social, um, that allow you can use those uh, social resources to gain more influence. Uh, and pivotally, I think one of the things that Hobbes emphasizes, and I don't think that uh, modern politics emphasizes this enough, enough, it's a very ancient notion, but that one of the sort of uh, main features of human life is fate or good luck. So this sort of pagan idea that the gods have a lot to do with how our lives turn out, uh, in any case, or the opportunities that we have, but he certainly makes that uh, an important point. So his argument then is that we have these powers, or to make it sound more benign, uh, for us would be capacities or resources that we are born with or acquire or uh, mobilize ourselves to acquire, uh, but also innate qualities. And there's this complex um, uh, combination of them in our lives. And uh, we use these powers uh, to essentially maneuver through life, essentially capacities, resources, skills, and so forth. So uh, far from being an entirely individualistic perspective, however, he does see us as unique individuals, but we're also embedded in all of these social relationships necessarily. So I'll read out a few of the types of powers that he refers to, to give you a sense of how power for him is very much social insofar as our capacities, our power, our powers, our resources are dependent upon how we successfully interact with other people. Again, this isn't simply about domination at all. A lot of it's about cooperation, sharing enterprises, and so forth. To, yes, to get our aims, but also we do this in cooperation with others. So for instance, he says, and this is a 17th century con uh, context, he says, to have certain, to have servants is power, to have friends is power, for they are strengths united. So if you have friends, you can pool the resources with your friends to get something done. So again, I think there's a very sort of benign aspect to it. He says, good success is power because it makes a reputation of wisdom. Uh, nobility, this is interesting. So nobility is power, but not in all places, only in those commonwealths where it has privileges, for in such privileges consists their power. So you can be a noble, you know, you think of those Russian aristocrats after the Russian Revolution, they didn't have any power, it was done because the social context no longer gave them the power of being count or so on and so forth. Uh, eloquence is power because it seems, because it is seeming prudence. So eloquence is power because people then think you're wise if you have it. Uh, then he says form is power, meaning sort of bodily shape, because being a promise of good, it recommends men to the favor of women and strangers. Basically, if you're a beautiful man, in this case he's talking about, um, you can attract women, people think you're nice, and so on and so forth. So you can use that to your advantage in negotiating social relationships. He also says, and this is interesting, the sciences are a small power because not eminent, and therefore not acknowledged in any man, nor are at all but in a few, for science is of, of that nature as none can understand it. So the, the problem is, it's, uh, a scientist can be as brilliant as they want, but if they live in a society in which uh, the type of knowledge that they have is obscure, it kind of doesn't really matter. It doesn't really give you that much eminence. So then he sums up the public worth of a man, which is the value set on him by the Commonwealth, is that which men commonly call dignity. So a lot of what we do as we maneuver in the world is attempt to have a good reputation in relation to other people. And that's sort of the, the sort of dynamic of how we negotiate the world in order to get what we want. In terms of uh, the, the political conclusions that he comes to about this, he thinks that we need a state in order to set rules about all this. And it's interesting to look at the rules that uh, Hobbes sets forth that he wants the sovereign to institute. 
He refers to these as laws of nature that the sovereign should take account of. And what's interesting, if you look at the sort of thrust of all these laws of nature, basically what they're doing is attempting to create a framework in which human beings publicly acknowledge to one another that they are equals. Uh, and it's about public self-presentation as opposed to private thoughts and so forth. It doesn't really care about that. So long as you're polite in, in society, everything's good. So long as you acknowledge other people as your equals, you can achieve peace. That's sort of the argument. As one commentator, Samantha Frost, she wrote this fantastic book called uh, Letters from a Materialist Thinker. She says, uh, the laws of nature delineate how individuals must contrive to be seen. That is to say, they elaborate a kind of self-presentation individuals should undertake in order to appear to their interlocutors as thinking bodies who are well disposed to the cause of peace. So that's the whole thrust of the formation of the rules of the state. And if we look at some of the rules that um, uh, Hobbes sets forth, they are things like the third law is to perform our covenants. In other words, to keep our promises. Uh, the fifth law of nature is every man strive to accommodate himself to the rest. So be sociable. Uh, the sixth, which is interesting in the current context of discussions about reparations and so forth, is pardon past offenses if someone repents. And his argument is if you don't accept uh, um, the, uh, a pardon from people or a society or so forth, it just means future uh, divisions and arguments. Uh, the eighth law of nature is to have a peaceful public demeanor. Uh, so no man by any deed, word, countenance, or gesture declares hatred or contempt of another. And the ninth law of nature, which is famously acknowledge others for his equal by nature. And the 10th is the equal rights of all subjects. All of this is mobilized basically to cre create a culture of peace. And as Samantha Frost says, individuals should conceive of themselves as inevitably part of a collective whose constitutive relations have a significant bearing on the possibilities of peace, security, and prosperity that each individual can imagine and pursue. So it's up to everyone to participate in this attempt to acknowledge one another as equal, with equal interest insofar as we all want to protect our bodies and our endeavors. Uh, so that's just a sketch then. And then I just want to, uh, in the, don't want to go on too long, but in terms of a contrast, I think that Hobbes's vision of the human personality offers in contrast to identity politics uh, some of the points such as the following. First of all, there is an insistence on the commonality of the human condition. There is an insistence that all human beings are fundamentally equal and the same insofar as we are all embodied creatures trying to preserve our bodies and advance our aims. And we're all mortal, we're all vulnerable. Uh, we also are, by definition, incredibly unique. He talks about specific personalities, someone's quick-witted, dull-witted, excitable, vain, strong. Everyone is driven by different passions and aims. So everyone is fantastically unique. Moreover, everyone is shaped by very individual histories and experiences that shape our life chances and personalities. So we're very individual at the same time we're embedded in a web of social relationships. Um, and we negotiate the world with our individual attributes, but also with the powers that socially we may have or may not have. Our family connections, talents, friends, family, and so forth. So in other words, in my view, Hobbes presents human beings as existing in a kaleidoscope. Their personalities are more of a kaleidoscope than existing on pre-given, uh, with pre-given characteristics that place them on a grid that moves them mechanically up and down depending on history, current trends, and so on and so forth. So, um, so and then also in terms of fate, uh, human beings are shaped by the fact that they may be born in a time of 
depression, a time of war, a time of prosperity. A lot of this is just dumb luck in terms of where you're situated in terms of life. So that's basically the sketch. And I just wanted to end with maybe a few, um, just a few counterexamples using a sort of Hobbesian frame versus an identity politics frame. And with the argument that Hobbes can help us get out of the logjam of identity politics. So for instance, you think of, I mentioned Barack Obama before, on the grid, Obama is oppressed because he is um, a, an African American. Uh, nonetheless, he rose to the highest office in the land, that is to say, and that's to do with him, his particular intelligence, his particular level of education, his particular eloquence, uh, the excellent relationships he has, his personal stunning personal charm, all those things. However, it also has to be said that he's also maneuvering in a world that is post Jim Crow, post slavery. So that matters as well. So I think both things can matter. It are the individual qualities and the social structure. And I think Hobbes gives us that. Um, so I'll just leave it at that, you know, not to fetishize Obama or anything like that, but he's just a really good example. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Hello. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Uh, I think uh, Robert's going to uh, uh, come Should in I now. Can I my microphone yeah. Yeah. when he's talking? Yeah, Robert's coming in yeah. now. Yes. Uh, th thank you very much, Joanne, for your uh, really interesting uh, talk. It uh, inspired me to download Hobbes' uh, Leviathan. I think it would be good uh, leisure reading, maybe. Um, we're going to call in the first uh, question, uh, per person who's going to ask a question. That's uh, Samir uh, Gandesha. Uh, if uh, Samir wanted to ask uh, his question. Yeah, um, thank you very much, John. I really enjoyed the talk. And um, I think I got a preview of some of the arguments when I was in Winnipeg uh, in November. I think we were talking a little bit about your idea for for this paper, and um, it's, a, it's a terrific argument. Um, I have one comment and, and then a question. Um, the first comment is that I think your argument about what identity politics is could be strengthened by um, maybe paying a little bit more attention to some of the things that uh, Azad Haider says in his book, Mistaken Identity, which you, you, you referenced. And he um, shows that it's the Kumbahi uh, River Collective that first comes up with the idea. And this is, in a sense, the, also the first idea of intersectionality, that it's not just, you know, these um, separate forms of, of oppression that are isolated from one another, but the way in which they, they converge, right? So, yes, uh, Barack Obama is uh, uh, from the uh, elite, um, so he ha occupies a certain class position, but then also a certain um, position within a kind of racialized hierarchy. Um, so I think you would only strengthen your argument by, by bringing those nuances in a little bit. Um, uh, the question I have though is, what do you make of um, the way in which Hobbes has been interpreted by a figure that you could say is um, engaged in a kind of identity politics of, of the right, which is Carl Schmitt, right? Carl Schmitt uh, made quite an influential interpretation uh, of Hobbes. Schmidt's very interested in the idea of sovereignty and argued that um, sovereignty itself relies on um, the political, and the political is the division um, of uh, friend and foe, and the way in which this division uh, is, um, is constructed is through a principle of, um, uh, of a hom homogenous people. Uh, that confronts its its enemies in a very existential way. So you have this kind of identity politics on the right, often called these days identitarianism. So there's also this identity politics on on the right that we need to maybe think about. But but I think Schmidt is such an interesting case because he wants to take Hobbes in this direction. So I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. Thanks. Excellent points. Uh, in terms of the intersectionality, yes, as I said, it's a, I, I sort of gave the, the sort of most general sketch of identity politics and some of the problems. So uh, I agree with that in terms of um, other notions of identity politics. That was very uh, uh, sort of general. 
Uh, in terms of uh, the right, but also very, very typical interpretations of Hobbes, there is a move now, I think there's sort of more of a trend to focus on Hobbes' materialism, but also the sort of underlying project that it really is, and it is curious because his solution is absolute sovereignty. But actually, if you read him carefully, there's a, quite a radical edge to him. It isn't the case, you know, a lot of people quote this and say, you know, once the sovereign loses power, et cetera, et cetera, then you can ditch the sovereign, which is what Hobbes was doing with Leviathan, which was defending Cromwell's regime, which is why everybody hated him. The royalists hated him, the Democrats hated him, and so on and so forth. Um, but there's also um, uh, passages in Leviathan where, and people in the 17th century picked up on this, they referred to Leviathan as a catechism of rebellion, where he says, uh, he says, on the one hand, he says, rebellion is never justified, it's terrible. And then he says, you know, it's outrageous. And he says, however, if there's a rebellion and the sovereign declares war against you, you have the right to protect your body. So a lot of people see this as, people see this as a contradiction. That's how it's been posed. But I think in, many people now see this as actually, no, of a piece that really the object of um, the formation of a state is precisely to protect bodies and allow bodies to uh, maneuver in the world without uh, much interference. So that's, so there's sort of this kind of interesting, um, uh, rad extremely radical edge. So there's actually people who, like this woman, uh, Ingrid Mackis, she's at Brock, I think, she wrote this book about uh, women and classical uh, political theory. And she argues that Hobbes, essentially you have an argument for a welfare state with Hobbes because the end for protecting women and so on and so forth. Because, you know, you are, and he, he argues for public charity and so on and so forth. So I think there's that dichotomy. So yes, you can do a Carl Schmitt, but I actually think it's not quite true to Hobbes. But I'm, I'm trying to make him into a Marxist, basically, I think. <laughs> Joanne, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Samir. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Henry. He had a question to ask. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you for the talk. And um, I was uh, asking my question about your comment. I'm, not, I'm sorry, the quote that you gave, which was war of all against all. And uh, my question is, um, maybe you can talk a little bit now, because now we are at a very different time. We have democracy. It's a very different time than the Hobbes time. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the need for law and order, especially in what we're seeing with the riots in the streets? Absolutely. I have been thinking about Hobbes quite a lot watching uh, all the news. Uh, one of, to be, often it's uh, people just think that Hobbes refers to the war of all against all as a kind of pre social situation, but really what he actually says is that, uh, you know, you can look at, you know, he refers to Native American societies and so forth as living in the state of nature, um, where there's the war of all against all. But he says, really, it is civil war is the war of all against all. Civil war is the state of nature. So that, and he's writing this, he writes Leviathan in 1651, just after England has had almost 10 years. I mean, more people proportionally were killed in the Civil War than were killed in World War I. It was devastating. So that's why Hobbes is driven and obsessed with the conditions of peace and cooperation, even though he's often seen as a war philosopher. In fact, he's obsessed with peace. I would say he's an apostle of peace. And precisely, he says, you need law and order. There, uh, there are no covenants without the sword. So, and potentially in the United States, people are, I think from a Hobbesian standpoint, people are playing with fire. Uh, they've done so literally, but they're also doing so metaphorically. Because if you don't like the existing regime, which is what Hobbes is saying, try the state of nature, you will be horrified. 
and also the notion that um, uh, law, uh, civilization is incredibly fragile. And again, he just lived through 10 years. Actually, he ran away. He went to France. Uh, and he was always very proud of that, that he was one of the first to leave because he, you know, proclaimed himself a coward. But in any case, uh, absolutely it applies. Yes. I think. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, uh, very much. Yeah. Thanks. And um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Um, uh, we'll call on uh, Frances Wooderson. She wanted to uh, ask a question. Go ahead, Frances. You need to unmute. Thank you very much, Joanne. I thought that was a fascinating lecture. It's great. It's a great idea you have here. We have all these apparent intractable problems, and let's bring back some um, classic philosophers to try to sort this out. Um, and, and I'm just trying to think through your arguments a little bit here. And I was wondering what your thoughts, uh, whether I've got this correct in terms of what you're arguing, which it seems to me that um, the, the problem that you're kind of getting at with respect to identity politics is that it's very selective about the identity features which it thinks are significant. And Hobbes, it seems from what you were putting forward, um, has a much more nuanced view of the role that identity would play in this, in your ability to, you know, I guess, compete with others in the, in the society. You mentioned just at the end in your response to Samir about Marx and Karl Marx, and I'm just wondering um, how this would all fit. Like, what would Karl Marx say about those arguments? Um, would he say that really Hobbes was mistaken in his more nuanced view because um, it fails to understand the the huge significance of class? Like, class is a much more um, uh, important uh, variable than Hobbes would give uh, account for. Uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts would be on trying to kind of widen that analysis to include Karl Marx in, in your discussion. Thank you. Yeah, so, oh, that's a great, those are great observations. And I think the thing, um, and I thought about the Marx bit, but I think if you look at Marx's conception of human beings, there is obviously that strong, deep materialism. But if you read Hobbes in contrast, I think what's different is Hobbes gives you a mo much more complicated sense of human motivation. And a lot of the motivation is based on individual personality. So that's the, there's that aspect of individualism. But it's um, it, this kind of baffling array of what people get upset about or what they're driven by. So he talks about kings, you know, some of them are expansionists, some of them are cowards, some of them just want monuments built uh, to themselves or individuals, some of them love science and learning, some of them just want a workaday life, some of them are lustful um, in terms of sex, some of them are lustful in terms of gold. It just, there's so, I think there's a much richer uh, picture of human motivations. Uh, and I think the, the sort of weakness of Marx in contrast to Hobbes is precisely that the motivation is sort of mechanical, materialistic, as opposed to, you know, with Hobbes, I think you can have someone, you know, you can have sort of a mother figure or something whose simple motivation in life is to have as many children as possible, just adores children. And that's a type of human motivation that's explicable simply by our human diversity or someone who is religious, a monk or something like that, that's what they're driven by. And not everything is reducible to economics. So I actually think it's a richer um, description of human motivation. It's quite extraordinary actually, if you read it carefully. So humans are motivated by 50 things in his view. Uh, and it's shaped by their personality, but also it is shaped by their social embeddedness as well. So I don't think that, um, I think it could also fit some kind of notion of group oppression 
Uh, but again, the group oppression is a thing, but it's counterbalanced by individual motivation and characteristics and so on and so forth. So yeah, great question. I don't know if that answers it, but. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, Malcolm Bird will be the next uh, person asking. Malcolm could speak. Okay, thank you very much for that, Joanne. Um, I just have a very general question comment. Um, um, you know, at, at the core is that, that Hobbes is lauding modernity and humans' capacities to work together, build a peaceful society, and, and enjoy the wealth that comes from that peaceful society. And it seems to me that identity politics adherents tend to loathe modernity and, and have utter contempt for modern institutions. Um, and so are, are we kind of in different paradigms here? And is it even possible to have a dialogue between these two, these two views? I just, your comments on that. I hope so. I think we're in danger of people not realizing how fragile, in terms of the previous question, I can't remember the man's name who asked it, um, but here's what he says. Uh, basically, it's a message to human beings to be very careful about what they play with, with complaints against the state and so forth. You know, of course, he wants the state, I think, to give people freedom of maneuverability and so forth. So here's a quote from Leviathan. He says, the estate of man can never be without some incommodity or other. And that the greatest that in any form of government can possibly happen to the people in general is scarce sensible in respect of the miseries and horrible calamities that accompany civil war or that dissolute condition of masterless men without subjection to laws and a coercive power to tie their hands from rapine and revenge. So basically what he's saying is be careful about complaining about, and, and also that he makes the argument that people complain about the government and he's going, no, it's just the human condition. Human condition is just a drag because we're mortal, because we're physical, because we suffer and we live in fear. So to have this sort of peaceable community, however flawed is a great gift and an accomplishment. So I think that kind of addresses what you were saying, Malcolm. But I don't know if, People can hear that uh, now. I don't know if they can hear that because, I mean, I think the United States, it's an incredibly uh, dangerous situation and people are um, being flippant about centuries of work and cooperation and it is so fragile and they are playing with fire. It is very frightening to watch from my point of view, anyways. Thank, uh, thank, thank you very much, Joanne. I, I often wonder about that uh, from the, uh, if, if you were to take, I, I always wanted to read uh, more magazines uh, from like the Harpers from uh, the 1850s um, and find out what people actually were saying in the US uh, years before the Civil War because um, things change um, it, it, because, Looking backwards is always easier than looking forward, I think, um, to the future. Uh, the next person uh, to ask a question will be Sink um, McRae, and there we go. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, uh, Robert, and thanks, Joanne, for your for your very interesting talk. Uh, I, I'm a philosopher in Calgary. It's been um, I used to teach a course in the history of ethics, and I used to have the students read. I think the first 17 or 18 chapters of Leviathan, but it's been a long time since I've, I'm a little bit rusty on my, my Hobbes, but I just wanted to frame my way of, of seeing Hobbes's contribution, main contribution uh, to uh, our understanding of our political association and see how it lines up with your take on the, his view about identity politics. So I think the great thing that Hobbes did was to recognize that our political associations exceed the bounds of our more tribal associations. And he articulated the means by which we could maintain that kind of association that required that we step beyond uh, narrow affective bonds 
And the way that I see the problem with identity politics, I, I think as you're sketching it out, is that that's a step backwards insofar as it is a step away from trying to find ways to promote cooperation through, through the exercising of reason. So Hobbes has a really nice story about political legitimacy and the monopolization of the use of force in the state. So it's a, it's a, it's a compact, it goes both ways. On the one hand, we cede over to the state monopolization of the use of force, but on the other hand, that's dependent upon them maintaining the status of political legitimacy, and that's where the argument about equality comes in. So insofar as you're engaged in identity politics that are, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be offensive, but one phrase that I've heard is, uh, is, is, the, is the phrase a chimpanzee politics. It's a, it's a kind of, it's a politics for a very small group that doesn't fit a larger association. So I think it's really important of the, even though I have questions about equality, that, 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 that idea of equality and the link to, to reason. So I think that that's a, a, a perspective from which you can uh, critique the uh, claims of identity politics as actually not really fitting into the complex political associations that we have to deal with. So uh, I think of identity politics as a kind of a, well, one way of framing it is in terms of, of, of its ethnocentricity. So although there are small groups, the problem that we face in society is we have states that, that encompass more than just these small groups. So we have to get along and uh, we have to get along in these larger groups. Anyways, I'll stop right there. Thanks very much for an interesting talk and I'll turn it back to you. Oh, uh, that's really interesting. You know, uh, it sort of makes me uh, think of this connection between what, so Hobbes was obsessed with, as everybody in the 17th century in Europe was with religion. And one of the things that people don't realize about Hobbes is in a way, he was a, a skeptical philosopher. So he actually shares a lot of the same views as postmodernists to some degree. But what he says is, uh, we can never really know facts, the truth. He says science is conditional, for instance. I mean, skepticism was massive in the 17th century. Postmodernists did not invent it. I mean, it goes back to ancient Greece. But it, so in terms of, when he talks about religion, one of the things he, he, and what he said about religion was outrageous for the 17th century. People thought he was an atheist, they hated him. Uh, but what, one of the things he says about religion that's so dangerous is precisely that it's subjective. That is to say um, that if somebody claims they're a prophet, there is absolutely no way to know if they are or not. So he argues for a state religion, and it sounds horrifying, but it's the blandest religion. There's two rules. Obey the, uh, Jesus is Lord and obey the law. That's it. So he sort of sets out these minimal conditions that people can agree on. And basically, if you think you're a prophet, keep it to yourself. If you're an Episcopalian, or a ranter, just stop it. You know, go to services on Sunday, you know, like let's all pretend that we believe this. So it's interesting in terms of the issue of something like race now. I actually think what, uh, in terms of the American situation, I actually think that we are seeing the uh, racial politics essentially become sort of parallel to religious politics. That is to say the notion is that there's uh, an experience of race that is incommunicable to others and it is somehow it's becoming sort of sacred these people are blessed and so on and so forth we are seeing white people <laughs> kneel before black people for forgiveness it is I, I it's absolutely chilling this is uh the cultural revolution 101 and the, and again the problem is as you were saying that that there's no connection between these human beings because of their subjective conditions. There's no bridge. And as I said, I think Hobbes gives us the bridge, which is peaceable society, here are the rules. Um, I don't know what your consciousness is. I mean, he literally says human beings are, you know, atomized individuals who have absolutely no access to knowledge of the other. And that's why we fight. And that's what, what's dangerous. So anyways, I don't know if that, that's maybe too far afield, but. Thank you very much. Um, we have one more question and then uh, we're going to wrap up uh, from Philip. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'll show the. Uh, okay, I'm an engineer, as 
a lot of you may not realize, although I've been a member of SAS for what, since about the 1990s, um, I've had a very interest in the, <clears throat> the debates that have taken a place about the nature of scientific knowledge. Um, in particular, uh, found myself publishing some savage critiques of feminist analyses. Um, the question I have, which I came across, is that in educating myself about Hobbes, was um, apparently he opposed the methods that the Robert Boyle and others were uh, inventing experiments to an, in, improve our knowledge. Um, I just wondered why, given his obvious broad intelligence. Uh, part of it was skepticism. Uh, it, he was actually sort of prefiguring Hume in a sense that you can't uh, simply because something happened doesn't mean it'll happen again. So he was suspicious of that. At the same time, he was a, a deep, powerful proponent of applied science, of um, engineering and so on and so forth. Absolutely saw that as completely fundamental. In fact, I just wrote a paper about this uh, in terms of Hobbes's economic theory, which is very thin uh, in terms of what he actually said. But I I argue that actually, if you look at his definition of philosophy, he literally says philosophy is about, it's about method and the point of philosophy is the utility of philosophy. That is to say the application of consistent method to practical problems. Uh, so uh, <coughs> does that make sense? So in fact, yeah. he was a proponent of practical uh, yeah. science. It's it's comment, the comment is interesting because um, <clears throat> David Hume, uh, was it Hume, uh, the philosopher Hume, yeah. he, he uh, uh, basically opposed, uh, as we understand it, according to some of the writings, he imposed, opposed the idea of induction as a form of argument. And, and yet all of science is based on induction. Um, and in fact, it was really only made acceptable with the development of a theory of probability but one of the reasons that i've taken a strong interest in this is that <clears throat> there have been a whole bunch of sociologists and philosophers that have tried to critique science which basically boils down to a refusal to accept induction as a method of establishing knowledge yeah i think that's right but hobbes again was a deep skeptic at mm. the same time was uh you know as i said you know praised practical accomplishments of science is absolutely fundamental i mean there's this wonderful quote where he and it's from uh where the hell is it from? <clears throat> one of his earlier works and then he talks about he talks about um you know the uh different civilizations and he says you know china <clears throat> Europe have uh basically created societies of plenty and he says and in other parts of the world, North America and so forth, they haven't. And he says, it's not because people are intellectually different. It's simply a failure to apply philosophy consistently and develop it. So he sees, essentially, people then didn't separate the natural sciences and philosophy. It was part of philosophy. Right. So he explicitly says that. But he's still a skeptic. He's the guy who, it's just so stupid, he tried to square the circle. Like everybody thought he was a complete crank. And he didn't know anything about math and he was always fighting with people and he wasn't allowed into the royal society so <laughs> he was bitter <laughs> yeah i've read about that thank you <laughs> yeah 